John Doyle in. Heck off, Kami. Hello there, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Heck Off, Kami. It is good to be back. New studio mode activated, content mode activated. We're very excited about it. I hope you are as well. And we're still fine-tuning everything as far as the shots and the lights and the audio goes, all that stuff. So this probably isn't the ultimate and optimal setup for the new studio, but we'll get we'll get it locked down as we go along. We'll make it better. This is not even my final form, and such was the case with the last studio as well. So we anticipated this, but the problem is that very few others will take this into account. So got to get used to the new setup. Got to tweak the colors and the lights and the angles and stuff as we we go along. Maybe one day we'll even unlock camera three, the forbidden angle. Who knows? But anyways, we're going to get into this list here. And I do have to say that I've enjoyed the time off because it's allowed for things to sort of uh, like ferment intellectually. And I'd estimate that I probably got about 9% smarter in the time off. So that's cool. And I'll explain my absence at the end of the video so that we can just get right into it now. But just know, just rest assured that there is a method to my madness. The HOC network has expanded to be larger than ever before. We have people everywhere. We have them in media and government and local government, and we have their attention. We are literally the heck off communist octopus just have our tentacles everywhere which of course is necessary because we're trying to shift our country in the right direction and to do that we need to have the attention of powerful people along with of course making ourselves as powerful as possible and that's going to get into the first thing that i want to talk about before we get into the list, which is institutional power, the necessity and urgency of institutional power. I'm going to monologue about that for a bit here, and then we'll get into the list of five policies that I've aggregated. We're actually, we're going to do 10 of them at first, but it's been a while, so we're going to have to microdose John Doyle. But some of them might confuse you, some of them you might disagree with, but I will explain why. They are absolutely imperative, and some of them are even uh, below the radar to where we could probably get these into the mainstream discussion and even enacted in certain states within like the next two years. But first, we must address the elephant in the room which is that Father's Day is right around the corner. And we all know that dads are very difficult to shop for because male nature typically dictates that if we want something, we just go get it. So every year, you're panicking like, what do I get for my dad? I understand this frustration, I do. When I shop for the women in my life, my gifts are so good, I make them cry. They collapse to the ground. The, the concoction of thoughtfulness, joy, surprise, presentation, it's literally too much for their brains to handle, so they just start short-circuiting. But with dads, it's like, what does this man want that he doesn't already have? I'll tell you what he wants. He wants things that exist as accessories to things that he already has. Your mom has dreams of learning to play the violin and, and, and seamstressing. That's not your dad. Your dad doesn't want you to give him a new hobby for Father's Day because then it's not a gift, it is a chore. Let him do his own thing, help out if you can. And given the events of the last 18 months and frankly the last decade or so, I would wager that your dad is one of the nearly 5 million new gun owners and maybe even lives in one of the half of states in this country signing constitutional carry into law. And so I must point out to you that one company has emerged as the leader in everyday carry and that is We the People Holster. We the People holsters are 100% American made and custom molded to fit your exact firearm for a quick, smooth draw. With thousands of options to choose from, plus a selection of custom printed holsters, you are sure to find just the right fit for your lifestyle. Plus, their proprietary clip allows you to customize the cant and ride for a comfortable fit you can wear all day. But that's not all. Check out their complete line of patriotic shirts. Their 100% American made tactical gun belt with the proprietary talent buckle and premium line of bacon jerky. Go to wethepeopleholsters.com slash Doyle right now. Get an additional $10 off with the offer code Doyle at checkout. Every holster comes with a lifetime guarantee. If it's not a perfect fit, send it back for a full refund. It's not even a big deal. WeThePeopleHolsters.com. That is WeThePeopleHolsters.com slash Doyle. Promo code Doyle. Very epic. Anyways, we are less than a year into the Biden administration, and things are getting much worse at a much quicker pace than we anticipated. Like, I'm sure you, I don't need to remind you. Inflation, gas prices, housing bubble censorship, targeting political opposition with federal police, etc. The point being that if you are tired of losing and you actually care about your country, then you need to understand and be comfortable with the knowledge that we are going to have to break free from the fake conservatism of the last several decades that got us here in the first place. It does not make any sense to continue to run the same plays that have literally never worked for you at any point, obviously. And so as we get into some of these policies, you might think to yourself, well, now, wait a minute. Well, that doesn't sound very conservative to me. And there are two things that I will say to that. Firstly, conservatism properly understood is simply that which conserves the traditional American society. That is the ends. It is not an allegiance to abstract principles or means. It is an allegiance 
to the ends, to actually conserving something. And in case you need a reminder, we have failed to conserve anything on virtually any issue in the last 80 years. I therefore reject any input from neoconservatives who don't get it yet or who don't have the intellectual capacity to ever get it because frankly, I understand what's happening. I understand why it's happening. I understand who's behind it because I've done the reading and that's the difference. Lots of people can only conceptualize conservatism in terms of what they've heard on talk radio or cable television or whatever. And so given that, let me ask you this. And this is the second thing. Why do you think that you were allowed to hear that? And I'm not saying that these people are necessarily bad people or that they sold out or something, but why would the system allow for anything that would pose a challenge to it to be broadcast in mass? Notice how they only started censoring people once there was a legitimate effort to push back against the system, once we had a candidate who was actually a threat to the establishment in this country, to the swamp, to the deep state. And so to all the well-meaning patriots out there, all the good people out there who just want us to return to a libertarian society, just like the founding fathers wanted, I understand that and I sympathize with that, but we need to understand that it is literally the same thought process as, well, that wasn't true communism. Well, this time we'll get it right. And it's like, well, that wasn't true small government conservatism. This time we'll get it right. Because the reality of the situation is that right now, we're not suffering from the consequences of inauthentic conservatism, but rather we are suffering from the consequences of what we regard to be actual conservatism, which exists to distract and drain time and money from well-meaning patriots who actually care about this country. These people do not play to win. They play for lobbying contracts. Virtually everything that they do is performative. It is not real. Conservatism has existed in this country as basically a form of controlled opposition, which seeks to criticize, mock, and most irresponsibly and dangerously occupy crucial volume and resources without actually doing anything to push back against the left. It is all performative. Take the recent issue, transgender girls competing in women's sports, biological men competing in women's sports. It's ridiculous. The left have absolutely lost their minds, folks. How can men compete in women's sports? It's not fair to all of our female athletes. Does that ring a bell? We're familiar with the talking points. Let me ask you a question now. How exactly is your day-to-day -day affected by the collapse of the institution of women's athletics? This is not to say that biological men should be allowed to compete in women's sports. And actually, don't even call them biological men. That's just ceding more ground to the left rhetorically. Why would we need to use biologically as a modifier on the word man? Just say men. But yeah, this is not to say that men should be allowed to compete in women's sports. This is simply to say that the whole issue is totally performed. I quite frankly cannot think of a less important, less consequential noun on American soil than women's sports. Oh, well, but young girls won't get as many trophies now because they have to compete against transgender girls. Hell yeah, that's male excellence right there. Let's go, boys. But seriously, no, I understand the problem. I understand the concerns. I understand the importance of athletics and competition. I do. But my problem is that the discussion in itself is not a serious discussion. The issue of boys with gender identity disorder competing in women's sports is about 10 years downstream of the actual problem, which is that we as a country are entertaining the idea that gender, sex, biology, hormones, it's all unimportant, it's all insignificant. And so what I'll say is this. Yes, I believe that men should be prohibited from participating in women's sports, absolutely. But I also believe that propagating gender theory and its adjacent strains should be prohibited in any institution receiving public dollars. Because if you don't do that, then you're just going to end up right back there anyways. As it would turn out, there's no such thing as, well, we just want to be free to do what we want in the privacy of our own home. That was a lie. The slippery slope exists. And if you think that you can deal with something down the mountain without shutting off the water at the top of the mountain, then you are not a serious person. You are not having a serious discussion. And this is the fundamental problem with the practical application of libertarianism. The problem isn't necessarily the ideas, but rather that our current context does not allow for those ideas. Libertarianism, the society the founding fathers wanted, however you like to describe it, it is not possible unless the society is a unified moral and religious people. James Madison, the father of the Constitution, said this, if you are going to opt to live and let live, to not seize power, to maintain the power vacuum, then the other people have to agree to do this as well. But the reality of our situation is that the people in our country now, the communists, they don't want to leave that power on the table. They want to take it for themselves and use it against you. This is not debatable. They openly admit this. And so the problem with this small government conservatism that we've all been sold, aka the don't do anything because then you're just like the enemy who is winning, by the way, conservatism. The problem isn't that it's a bad idea on paper, just that it's only possible if those forces who seek to destroy that society are, are suppressed. Because if you allow that fire to sustain itself, it will spread, and before you know it, it'll be too late to stop it. The Founding Fathers knew this, we knew this before the neoconservatives co-opted the American right and made it into an impotent embarrassment. General Patton, General MacArthur, all of the greatest Americans that you and I could think of, they all knew this. And so I would make the argument that it is time for the libertarian types to join forces with us, to follow the logical conclusion of the NAP, of the Gadsden flag, to understand that what they're doing to this country is an act of aggression that will destroy it if you don't do anything about it, and that they are treading on you, and it is time to fight back. It is time to bite them. 
We have to gain institutional power. We have to wield it. But the response is always, well, but if we use the government, won't they just use it back? Understand it is already being used against you. The corporations are being used against you. That means worst case scenario, even according to you, and better believe it, you've done the math. We're just going to be back to square one. And so given that, and given that I'd actually like to be able to raise a family here someday, I've concluded that we may as well give it the old college try, right? Let's actually have some balls. Let's have a competent right-wing government for the first time in decades, and frankly, probably ever. Because if we lose, we are going to be regarded as the greatest, most impressively pathetic group of people to ever exist, that we let our country be destroyed by communists literal communists who masturbate to cartoon animals because we were too comfortable watching Netflix and browsing TikTok, blowing the home court advantage to literal communist perverts. That will be the biggest L in the history of mankind. And so the last thing I'll say about this before we get into the list is that the reason we used to be a much happier, much more unified, much more free country isn't because that was just like the natural state of our existence. It's because to be a communist 100 years ago was almost exactly what it's like to be a right-wing person now in 2021. It's almost one-to-one. -one. And when I say communist, I'm speaking broadly uh, about the coalition which all of these interest groups are ultimately serving. They're anti-American, they're anti-family, they're anti-God, they're anti-white, they're degenerate, etc. And actually on that note, Another important thing that no one talks about, why we were fighting communism, the fight against communism. It wasn't about wanting to be able to like, you know, run to Walmart at 11 p.m., get a pint of Ben and Jerry's and a phone charger. No, it actually had very little to do with capitalism. It was about the soul of the nation. It was about the fact that communists were godless. And we knew that. And we knew that without God, we would decay into basically where we are now. There's a reason that we mandated that in God we trust be inscribed on our currency in 1955. Your grandparents probably saw that change happen. And it wasn't because we loved capitalism and consumption, though the irony is that as we've lost God and we've become decadent and greedy and the money that we so idolize still has that inscription. That's beside the point. The point is that if you showed an American man in the 1950s what his country would become within the next hundred years, he'd want to go back to the drawing board. But anyways, think about that. Why were you never taught about how we used to treat communists the same way that they now treat right-wing people? It's because that is what is necessary to defeat them and actually conserve and protect the nation. They don't want that. They like it when you think that you have principles. I'm going to beat you in the marketplace of ideas, which by the way, they'll just kick you out of anyways because the left can act with total impunity because they have virtually all of the institutional power and you have none of it. hundred years ago, we used to target communists in the, in the government, in academia, in the media. You would be fired, blacklisted, maybe even charged. Now look where we are. Tables have turned. By the 1960s, they had taken over academia. By the 2000s, right-wing thought was non-existent. By the 2010s, 2010s, any student or faculty who dissented would be targeted. You will be made to conform. They did the same thing with similar timelines in public education, big business, media, Hollywood, etc. And so we have no idea how to push back. We are fish in a barrel. There are no right-wing organizations dedicated to getting individuals to strategize and infiltrate these apparatuses to take them back, partially because we're too busy raising $100,000 to totally own AOC because we act like literal children. Children. We have no right-wing George Soros. We don't even have our military anymore. Side note, do not join the military. Maybe I'll do a video on that later. But think about this. They're in such firm control over you that they can commit legitimate acts of violence and terrorism, and it will either be ignored or romanticized by the mainstream narrative. But if you listen to federal police when they tell you that you can enter a building as long as you don't break anything, they will arrest you and write the history books to compare you to the 9-11 hijackers. And so we essentially have two options, occupy a power structure or die, like literally die. And probably the only way to go about this is to do the same thing that they did. We need to have our own long march through the institutions. We need tens of thousands of disciplined, hyper-focused, patient, highly motivated individuals. Also to anyone thinking, well, but how do you know your ideas are correct? What if you're wrong and communism's actually correct and better? I don't even know how to answer that. Like, am I supposed to not be confident in my beliefs having done the homework? Do you think it's possible for us to know right from wrong? Do you need to see my math? Can I show you a picture of what the other side looks like? Because honestly, that's like the most compelling argument at this point. But simply put, the right tends to be more correct because our thinking is fundamentally rooted in reality and nature, and the left tends to be more incorrect because their thinking is fundamentally rooted in idealism. It's, it's literally like a rejection of reality and nature. But here's the sobering truth, and I wish this weren't the case, but everything throughout history suggests that it is, which is that it's not enough to just be right. You have to have the power to disseminate that truth because people aren't that smart. They're basically lemmings. Don't believe me? Still think the best ideas win? Okay, why do so many people all of a sudden think that gender doesn't exist anymore? Because the people who control the narratives told them so. People need to think for themselves, but they don't. We know what's right, we know what works, and we know that we need to trust ourselves to communicate that. The reason this country used to be better wasn't because of freedom and small government, it's because the people who were controlling the narratives weren't evil yet. Like, there has always been narrative control, there always will be, it is inevitable. 
We have to make the choice as to whether we take action to be the ones controlling it so that we can take our country back. Plus, we have God on our side, which is epic. But that being said, here's what scares me. In order to do this successfully, it would take about a century, literally. And that's about how long it took us to get here in the first place anyways. But what that means is that the people who get the ball rolling on this are very likely not going to live to see the results of their work. And it also means that people are going to generally have to work very hard at this and make sacrifices. And there are a few pretty significant impediments that we're going to face that the communists didn't have to face at the time, um, which are going to make this substantially more difficult for us. The first one is that our time preference and focus have been destroyed as a consequence of capitalism, technology the industrial revolution, et cetera, our ability to focus, like our attention span has literally been crippled by these things, especially in younger people. We can't focus. We can't delay gratification. We want more products, new products, new information, new stimuli, new dopamine now. And that's a huge problem because literally our biological capacity to do something like an institutional march has been compromised by the way our society has been structured. It is now less likely than it would have been a century ago for a group of people to have the requisite focus and time preference, et cetera, that is necessary for something like this to be successful. Not even as an indictment of their own character, but just because of the way society has become structured. It breeds this in people. Our society breeds mental illness, but we don't address that. Instead, we just give you your pills to make you feel like a zombie, but we're making progress, I guess, because at least Blue's Clues is pro-LGBT now. And that's a problem too, because people are depressed. They have no motivation, no ambition. They're getting strung out on drugs. They're committing suicide. They hate themselves. And this collective spiritual illness is literally a breeding ground for leftism. I know I've explained this before, but leftism properly understood is just mass mobilized mental illness. And I say that not as a baby boomer, like, oh, well, you guys are crazy. You lost your your damn minds, literally because these people are traumatized and they project that insecurity onto these victim narratives and they crystallize them within their identity. That's why half the time you ask these people to defend their political opinions, they just get emotional. They start crying. It's because it's not actually about politics. It is about spiritual sickness. And so not only are people just generally less motivated to do anything, they're also being bred to fall in line with these narratives and movements. And adjacent to this is the abandonment of God, the lack of belief in anything greater than themselves. So given that, why would they want to dedicate themselves to taking their country back if they're not going to live to see the results? You know, like, well, what's the point? What's in it for them? That's why they humiliate you by disgracing your military, disgracing your flag, putting a clown in the White House. It's a humiliation ritual. They want you to give up on your country. They want you to believe that it's not even worth fighting for anymore. And all of these reasons are why when people on the right do discuss a plan to take the country back, it always comes down to this fantasy of a moment of mass awakening. All of a sudden, the left is going to go too far. People are just going to snap out of it. Military is going to drain the swamp. Patriots in control. Trust the plan. No, none of that is going to happen. There is no big moment. There is no mass awakening because to awaken the masses assumes that they're capable of waking up, which they aren't. Stop fantasizing. Stop coping. Roll up your sleeves. Get to work. The light at the end of the tunnel for us has to be the knowledge that if we do our jobs correctly, then we will have statues erected of us in our honor. We will be revered throughout history. Think about that. If you're watching this right now, if you manage to do your job effectively, whatever that job may be in the struggle, and enough others do the same, you will literally be elevated to the level of the founding fathers in American history a few generations from now. And that's the greatest incentive, especially for young men, assuring them that we will cement their legacy, and we will. This is why when we take power, one of the first things that we'll do is put up statues and memorials across the country of great Americans to show that we will honor their efforts and their sacrifice. And that's the correct take, by the way, with the statues coming down and history being erased. Not that, well, they're trying to erase our history, but they're trying to erase it because they don't want it repeating itself. They don't want great Americans to be remembered because they don't want to inspire any more great Americans because they don't want there to be an America anymore. The greatest gift that you could give to future generations is their birthright, which frankly, previous generations failed to give you, and that is the United States of America. Hold on, allow me to shamelessly transition into product mode. Speaking of gifts, have you thought any more about what I said about Father's Day? Did you pick a gift yet? Well, you better figure that out now, because if you don't, you're gonna have to get him a last minute gift that you'll try to pass off as sincere. Here are some actual examples of last minute panic purchases I have given to my dad on various occasions. Season three of Cheers on DVD. Bop It, Tetris Edition, a one-ounce silver coin, a book by Nietzsche that I knew he wasn't going to read, etc. The reality is that Father's Day is coming up, and I can promise you that he doesn't want a mug or a tie. When you get your dad a mug or a tie for Father's Day, what you're really saying is, hey, Dad, I thought you should know that all I care to know about you is that you drink liquids and then vaguely have an interest in whatever's printed on this mug. And when you get your dad a tie, you're saying, hey, Dad, I thought that you could wear this to my event that you're going to have to pretend to care about. And you know what happens after that, boys and girls? It means that you're going to find out if you're 
your quirky color changing ceramic mug changes color with battery acid as well. Or if that necktie you picked out can heft 200 pounds, you don't want that. You wanna give him a gift that will save him thousands in ammo and take his marksmanship to the next level. You wanna get him iTarget Pro. iTarget was invented to give law abiding citizens a cost effective way to train in the safety and privacy of their own home. No more inconvenient trips to the range or expensive practice ammunition. Just download iTarget's proprietary app, load the laser bullet into your firearm and start your training experience. Dry fire training will help develop muscle memory, sharpen target reaction speed, sight alignment, trigger function, and more. iTarget Pro comes in all the major calibers, including 223 for your AR, so you can stay sharp with almost any firearm. Go to iTargetPro.com and save 10%, plus get free shipping with the offer code DOYLE. This is the smartest way for you to practice, and it pays for itself in one day. That is the letter I, TargetPro.com, iTargetPro.com, offer code DOYLE, very epic. Anyways, we will now get into the list of five new conservative policies to take our country back, starting with number one, which is, of course, that we have to get big tech under control. And I mean seriously under control. When I talk about almost everything that even the most hard-hitting, take-no-BS conservatives do as just performative, it really is true, especially on issues like big tech, which is one of the most important. So we hear about Republicans take action against big tech, epic win, libs triggered, libs on suicide watch, I'm drinking my leftist tears. And you actually look at like what they're doing, the action, like what the action is, uh, it's legally defining what a social media company is and then saying that if, well, they ban you, well, they have to let you know about it. So I'll lay out some additional things that should be done legally, and then I'll explain why. In addition to just legally defining what a social media company is and mandating that they notify a user when they're banned, how about this? All constitutional free speech is protected on all platforms. Any platform who censors, shadow bans, or deplatforms someone for constitutional speech will pay a very large fine each time they do it. Let's say a million dollars, because screw these people. And additionally, all previously banned candidates, independent journalists, activists, et cetera, must be reinstated unless the company can prove that their speech wasn't constitutional. And this would also protect current users who haven't been affected yet from the same treatment. Moreover, expand this not only into social media platforms, also internet service providers, telecommunications companies, so that they can't do this anymore either. That's basically the idea. We would effectively be guaranteeing First Amendment rights on the internet, which is the new public square. Oh, but John, if you expand your rights to include the internet, then eventually the government will use that power to take rights away, even though that's incoherent completely. There is literally no way for expanding First Amendment rights on the internet to come back to bite us. Like, sure, maybe it makes life a little bit harder in Silicon Valley, but they'll adjust. Remember, they're innovators. They'll be just fine without deciding who gets to have an opinion. And you can do this at the state level right now. Just call your people, organize, put pressure on them. We'll put out a script at some point for all these probably that you guys can use. We'll organize more in the future. But this is absolutely imperative for our future success because like we said, these platforms are the new public square and we are being targeted so severely that if we don't use what little power we have left to guarantee ourselves a seat at the table, then we're we're just going to be deleted from society and we will have no chance of turning the tide, let alone taking our country back. So we have to go after big tech, but we have to do so with teeth, with balls, because that's all these people respond to, force. We're the ones who will be placated by a performative display that is ultimately inconsequential. Oh, we totally owned him by asking him that question. These companies need to be met with force or else we will all be screwed, blued, and tattooed. Moving on to the second one, probably the most peculiar on the list, but just as important, we need to ban poison from being put in our bodies. Here's a fact I'm not sure if you know. On average, every week, you are ingesting one credit card's worth of plastic. Testosterone is down 40% in the last four decades. That's down 1% every year. Male sperm count is expected to reach zero by 2045. We're becoming this sick, confused, androgynous society, and a large part of that is the fact that we're ingesting microplastics, BPAs, phthalates, phytoestrogens, et cetera, et cetera. Everyone wants to point and laugh. Ha ha, funny sweat man says frog frogs are gay. No one wants to talk about the effects of atrazine on studies of South African claw frogs, how it made them effeminate, how it made the males start trying to mate with other males, how it made them disinterested in the females. No one wants to talk about that. These chemicals, and there are lots of them, are used in your food packaging, in the plastics that you use to store your food, in the cups and bottles out of which you drink. They're in your shampoos, in your toothpastes, they're in the tap water, they're in the meats, eggs, milk. They're getting into your system in more ways than we know, and we need to outright ban them. The great thing about the market breeding innovation is that when we ban things that disrupt the collective endocrine systems of the country, that literally make men more feminine, that are actively lowering their testosterone levels, the good thing is that it'll just innovate a new solution that isn't 
means altering our hormones. But this is incredibly important because disrupting your endocrine system makes you unstable. It makes you mentally ill and it also makes you more feminine. All of these things make you more likely to support the left, to support the narratives, the systems of power in this country, all of it. If you want a free, prosperous, happy society, then you must understand that the mass alteration of your people's hormones is not conducive to that. It makes them weak, it makes them emotional, it makes them depressed, and it is evil. And arguably, that's why it's allowed to happen and why it's swept under the rug. And this isn't a conspiracy theory, by the way. Like, literally, just Google it. It's all publicly available information. It's on the labels. They don't even try to hide this. It's just true, and no one talks about it. But anyways, moving on to number three, this one's probably going to be the most polarizing, but it's just so true. That is that we need an immigration moratorium. For those unfamiliar, an immigration moratorium means that we don't take in on the net any immigrants for a period of, let's say, 10 years. Before I explain why, let me just preface by reminding you that immigration in the way that we have it now is the greatest gift and weapon that the left has ever been given. The only reason that it is supported by the left is because they know that they can simply import voters to make the right electorally obsolete. And unfortunately, the right supports it too because they get paid off by big business uh, because mass immigration depresses wages. But anyways, there is nothing wrong with opposing something because it will hurt you politically, especially because the only reason that they support it is because it will help them politically. And not only help them, but cement victory for them. And I'll probably do a whole video on just this topic in the future. Let me know if you want to see that. But for now, what I'll say is this. Much of the immigration pitch in this country appeals to the patriot's ego, and even Ronald Reagan was guilty of this. We hear this rhetoric, how these people just want to come to America because it's just the greatest country in the world, and it's the land of opportunity, and it makes us feel like maybe we still are a great country, and I'm sure a lot of these immigrants who do come here, they absolutely believe that that's the case, and I love that. I sympathize with them, but unfortunately, yet obviously, we have to prioritize the needs of our country and our people, and the reality of the situation is that these immigrants are not assimilating, and they're taking more money out of the system than they put into it. The typical right-wing line is, well, I like legal immigration. What I don't like is illegal immigration. And then the elites are like, oh, I mean, okay, we'll just do it that way then. Think about it. What difference does it make if you get a thousand people from El Salvador, Somalia, wherever, you get a thousand of them at the border, what difference does it make if they run past the entrance or go through it? Seriously, what is the effective difference? A majority of both legal and illegal immigrant households are on welfare. So it seems that while there may be a lot of them who you know, really just want to make it for themselves in this country, the majority of them seem to want to loot a decaying empire undergoing its managed decline. Oh, but they help the GDP, John. The GDP, they help it. GDP, John. On paper, yeah, sure. How much of that benefits us, though, Americans? Because it's estimated that immigration, both legal and illegal, increases the GDP in this country by like 11%, like 1.6 trillion. Cool, right? Guess how much of that increase goes directly to the immigrants themselves in the form of wages and benefits, wages and benefits that Americans aren't getting. Fully 97.8%. GDP going up, supposed to benefit us, right? I mean, that's why you said it. No, total benefit is about two tenths of 1% of the GDP, about 35 billion. Oh, but John, when GDP increases, prices decrease. And I know this because Henry Hazlitt told me so in 1946. Okay, cool, irrelevant. I'll tell you why right now. But first, just internal that there is very little evidence uh, that indicates or suggests that immigration in any form is a substantial benefit to the American people. But that aside, here's why economic arguments about immigration are irrelevant. 19 out of 20 illegal immigrants will vote for Democrats. 9 out of 10 legal immigrants will vote for Democrats. This is a fact. We'll have a problem when liberals move from California to Texas, but they keep voting for the same policies that ruined where they came from in the first place. Yeah, what do you think is going to happen here? Do you think that they're going to totally abandon their culture? Do you think that they're going to get a white picket fence and, and start reading Thomas Paine and John Stuart Mill in the Federalist Papers? Well, I'm okay with immigrants as long as they assimilate. They're not assimilating. They don't want to assimilate. Well, but my family immigrated and we're assimilated. That's great. I'm, I'm happy, you know, good. But we're not talking about you. We're talking about very strong tendencies, not exceptions. Three generations of immigrants later in this country, they're still not assimilated. They actually are even more in support of Democrats. They only assimilate to American culture to the degree that American culture promotes its own destruction, degeneracy, communism, hatred of white people, etc. And that's the biggest thing. If a majority of these immigrants say they're against free speech, they're against gun rights, etc., and a vast, vast majority of them are are voting for Democrats who literally want to erase our country, how could you ever think that they're assimilating? That's just, that's irresponsible. Democrats are trying to uproot the country and they're only a few elections away from giving all of these illegal aliens the ability to vote. And then they're just gonna bring in more. And then we will never win an election again. 
And even if you wanted to change these people's minds, you don't have the institutional power to do that as quickly as would be necessary, even if it were possible. That's why we need an immigration moratorium. We need 10 years, net zero immigration. You want to bring over your spouse or your kids? That's fine. Welcome, welcome. But net zero. Also cut welfare benefits from illegals. Let them repatriate. And I know there's a lot of immigrants who are right wing, who love America. And that's great. I love that. But unfortunately, as I'm sure they know, the vast majority are aiding in the destruction of America. In 10 years, if we get our country on the right track, track again. Sure, we can reconfigure our policies, but right now what we're doing is absolutely unsustainable. And the final point is this. To be unfailingly pro-immigration is necessarily to be unpatriotic. Because if you believe that America needs other people from other countries to teach America how to create art or music or food or enterprise or technology, you simply haven't been paying attention. What you are saying is that other people are better than Americans and we need them to come in and help improve us because we just aren't good or capable by ourselves. The fact is, is that we didn't build the most advanced and prosperous society by pouring in 2 million people a year from the third world. We did it with our own people. Americans are smart. We can do the jobs. We can run our own country. We're still pioneers. And after we get things under control, after we start taking care of our own people, after we restore the American dream, which is dead, maybe we can start opening it back up to other people. Oh, well, but John, Steve Jobs was an immigrant. The guy who invented Google was an immigrant. Yeah, and now Google wants to kick you off the internet for having the wrong opinion, for being to the right of Hillary Clinton. So look where that got us. But seriously, those types of people are one in a billion, specks of dust in a haystack. If you take a thousand Americans and a thousand people representative of the current immigration proportions, lock each in a separate baseball stadium, tell them how to figure out or uh, tell them to figure out how to get to Mars or to create Google 2, Americans win. We're still the best. Let's start acting like it again. And you may not like it, but this is nonetheless true. To take our country back, we need an immigration moratorium. Oh, but the economic benefit, which you just explained, wasn't even significant. Oh, you mean the economy that's going to be destroyed when they inevitably vote Democrats into office and eventually solidify a one-party state, that economy? We can't assimilate millions of people from other countries each year if we can't even assimilate our own children so that they grow up to not hate their country. And right now we're struggling with that, with even that. But anyways, speaking of the children, we know that the backbone of society is the family unit. And so we need some strong pro-family, pro-child policies. Our fertility rate is currently below replacement. We need to start having more kids. I personally think it would be kind of cool if we bred the left out of existence. And so to do that, we need to make it easier for people to start families and to have lots of kids and provide for and protect those families. What are some ways we could do that? Ending no-fault divorce, rejecting any zoning laws that seek to end single-family home neighborhoods, thereby protecting the suburbs. This will defend expanding the right to carry for all U.S. citizens, constitutional carry, very epic, banning abortions, ending common core, implementing pro-family, pro-America education, banning hormone treatment, puberty blockers, all of that stuff for minors, banning drag queen story hour in public libraries, increasing tax incentives to get married and have children, reaffirming that marriage can only be between a man and a woman, uh, and when we take power, and we will, cleansing the system of all of its wasteful spending. Then we can redirect some of that money to things that are actually like cool, like a national honor, a medal for mothers and fathers who have stayed together and raised four or more children. That'd be sick. That'd be sick. Do that. And then like on the child's 18th birthday, we'll pay off your mortgage or something. Our country can't have a future if it doesn't have families. Who's going to carry the torch? More babies. Not tomorrow. Not after breakfast. Now. I'm going to get all the smartest people I know into an office. I'm going to figure out how to make it easier for young Americans to get married and have children. We're banning OnlyFans. And it's not canceling student debt. It's not guaranteed housing. Duh. Relax, lib. My least favorite trend on the left is when they pretend to care about family and community just because they want free stuff. Like, I know you people. You literally hide in your room during family gatherings or you just don't even show up. You are not family oriented. You are cringe. You are spiritually ill. But anyways, last one. This one is epic. We need a woke tax. I'm not even kidding. We'll come up with some like PR strategy like, oh, the Marketplace Neutrality Act, whereas the consumer should be free to consume without political messaging, whatever. Something to appeal to the centrists, something to appeal to the people who still think that bipartisanship is an option at this point, but the end result will literally be a tax, a financial penalty whenever a big corporation, not a small business, a big corporation that primarily sells a product or service that is not related to politics does something that either promotes a political message or agenda or discriminates against one. Coca-Cola teaches people to be less white, pay up, jackass. Companies move out of Georgia because they're restricting illegal voting measures and restricting abortions, pay up, something of that nature. Well, but John, who gets to decide that? Literally me and you and all of our friends. Like we're going to take power and we get to call the shots and frankly, we're being generous. But seriously, woke taxes are necessary to take the culture back because the reality is that a large part of American culture is rooted in consumerism. 
And that needs to be at the very least neutral so as to not reinforce the leftist narratives that are being propagated by every other aspect of the culture. And with all these policies, they're not set in stone. Most of them don't even exist yet. But the purpose is to get the ball rolling here, get the gears turning. There are very smart, capable people working in right-wing politics or looking to get involved in right-wing politics. Many of them are watching these videos, and I trust them to do the right thing when the time comes. But anyways, I said I'd explain the absence, but we've been going for a while here. So I'll just say that the time was well spent. We are very well equipped to keep moving and growing in the future. We have big plans. I thank you all for your patience. I was actually, I was running PsyOps in the Discord, which is back. Shh, it's super secret. The left can't shut it down this time though but you can try, humor my boys, they're, they're Marines, the ones running it. But yeah, I was intentionally spreading misinformation in the community, like face it boys, John's not, John's not coming back. He, he, you really think it was a coincidence that the last video was how to remain optimistic? Like, you know, I was bored, we do a little psyoping, it's called we do a little psyoping, but everyone had faith, they trusted the process, they were like, nah, he wouldn't leave us like that. And it's so true, it is so true. So thank you all for your patience. The content kitchen is now officially up and running, let's go. Hey guys, if you like this video, leave it a thumbs up, leave it a comment, subscribe to the channel, turn on post notifications, and of course, share the video with a friend. New microphone check? New, well, that's kind of dumb, actually, that the first thing I sort of mentioned as far as what's new was the microphone. New microphone check? New desk check? New Jesus bobblehead check? New sign check? Everything is new. New location check. New beard check. Same shirt, though. I really haven't changed that much. I really haven't changed at all, except I got 9% smarter. That's true. But thank you so much for watching, and may God bless America. This is intense, actually. This is the first time that we have struck the Jesus bobblehead, because this is the new Jesus bobblehead. And still, a lot of people are always like, why are you hitting Jesus? I'm not. I'm making the bobblehead bobble. If you don't understand why this is necessary, it's actually the bobblehead... I was going to say, I could and I would make the argument that to not bobble the bobblehead is actually an insult, an insult to, to nature and to God. But anyways, um, it's so true. Thank you so much for watching and may God bless America. Poof.